Coming up next, head back to the 80s when Sega produced a video game based on a Fuji TV character who wears a turban. Oh, that old saw? Wait, Sega? And Fuji TV? Well, now that's different. To learn all about it, stay here. This is GTV, the stuff of legend. In the late 1980s, Sega Enterprises of Japan had its hand in many pots. While you might think of home video games like Sonic the Hedgehog on the Mega Drive, aka Genesis, as the focus of the company, that's looking at things through a very narrow lens. Sega had its roots in a robust arcade business, in fact one that predates video games, selling jukeboxes and mechanical coin-up games in the 1960s. By the 70s, Sega was the largest and most profitable producer of arcade video games in Japan. The company was so successful, it led to a chain of game centers all across the country. Going into the 80s, Sega expanded, producing multiple lines of toys. Some were mechanical in nature, like the robot pitcher, while others, like Family Driver, integrated electronics and video. By the end of the 80s, Sega had established itself in the living room with the SG-1000 TV game machine and its successors, the Mark III and Master System. Leveraging their reach, Sega entered the world of anime, forging partnerships with several studios. In Japan, this collaboration is known as a media mix. Sega financed the productions. The studios would write and animate the episodes. Sega would have some degree of creative control. As the main sponsor, Sega products were featured on screen and advertised during station breaks. Characters from these productions would then be turned into toys, while the story arc of the series would be playable in video game form. The first of these Sega media mixes was with Tatsunoko Productions, creating Akai Kodan Zillion, in English, Red Photon Zillion, which debuted on April 13, 1987. Zillion tells the story of three young soldiers in the far-off future who uncover the secrets of the colonized planet where they grew up. Central to the plot is the eponymous Zillion, a gun powered by mysterious and rare crystals that are used to win the fight against the bad guys. The Sega Master System and a few Sega games were featured in the series. Alongside the anime, Sega produced a physical Zillion gun for use with an infrared light-based relay system commonly known under the brand name Laser Tag. Action figures of characters and vehicles from Zillion were also sold. In May of 1987, Sega released the Zillion video game for the Mark III and Master System. The series finale, that December, coincided with the release of a sequel. Both games came to the Western world, as did a second physical Zillion gun, the Light Phaser, that worked with some Master System games. In 1988, Sega joined Ashi Productions for a new series, Chouan Senshi Borgman, in English, Sonic Soldier Borgman. Similar to Zillion in many ways, Borgman featured a team of young soldiers on a mission to save 2030's Japan from destruction. A new line of action figures were produced, while the Zillion gun, which was also featured in Borgman, expanded into a range of weapons bearing the Zillion name. A Sonic Soldier Borgman video game was also released for the Mark III and Master System in December 1988 as the series came to a close. While the Zillion and Borgman series and games were in production, Sega had other projects in motion, going with the more traditional method of licensed video game releases. Many of the earliest Mark III games were based on manga and anime, Hokuto no Ken, aka Fist of the North Star, Spy vs. Spy and High School Kimengumi were just three early examples and far from the only ones. In 1987, Fuji Television, a part of Fuji Media Holdings, licensed to Sega the rights to produce a game for the revival of the popular series Anmitsuhime, in English Sugar Princess, which began in 1949. The animation was handled by Studio Piero, an independent animation house that often worked closely with Fuji TV. Tatsunoko Productions, who was simultaneously producing Zillion, assisted. Let's take a sidebar for a moment. When it comes to video games and Fuji TV, the first thing that comes to mind for many is a Nintendo game for the family computer disc system, Doki Doki Panic, which later became Super Mario Bros. 2 in the West, and eventually Super Mario USA in Japan. The old switcheroo is a story that has been told for decades. 
The game, Doki Doki Panic, was produced as one of many promotional items for the Yume Kojo Technology Expo, known in English as Dream Machine, held in the summer of 1987. The star of the game, Imajin, was the main image character for the festival, heavily featured in advertising, though never appeared in a Fuji TV show of his own. Much like Doki Doki Panic, Sega did the exact same thing with Anmitsuhime. The game was exported to the West, transforming the game into Alex Kidd High Tech World. Sega, Fuji, and Studio Piero would team up again, giving another long-running series, Osomatsu-kun, a video game of its own. One of the very first for the 16-bit Mega Drive, released in December 1988. The arrangement was a far cry from what was happening simultaneously with Zillion and Borgman. However, these games helped lay the foundation for the relationship between Fuji TV and Sega, even though the story of Super Mario Bros. 2 always gets all the headlines. In 1988, as Sonic Soldier Borgman reached its conclusion, Sega, Fuji, and Studio Piero reached an agreement to create an all-new anime series. Similar to the other two media mixes, Sega would have some creative input over the series and the exclusive rights to produce video games and toys. In a strange, some might say ironic turn, the star of this new media mix would be awfully familiar looking. When Sega, Fuji, and Piero put their heads together to create the star of this new project, the final design came to be a young boy named Hat, who wore a turban that contained magical powers, thus giving him, and the series, the name Magical Hat. His design looks an awful lot like our dear old friend Imogene. There's no document that serves as a smoking gun proving a connection, but with Imogene still fresh in people's minds, it made a lot of sense to borrow the idea. Yoji Katakura, who had previously apprenticed under Fujiko F. Fujio, created the final design of Hat and served as director of animation for the series. Magical Hat debuted on October 18, 1989, and ran weekly until July 1990, starting out on Wednesday nights at 6.30, but eventually jumping over to Friday near the end of the series. Old fables say that 63,000 years ago, a hero by the name of Magical Hat banished the demons of the Earth to the demon world, where they have remained ever since, isolated by a magical seal. In the present day, young Hat and his family visit Usan Island. Hat's father, an archaeologist, plans to research the area near a large volcano on the island, where the legendary Magical Hat was believed to have engaged in battle. For young Hat, it's an escape from the city life and a great way to have a summer adventure. While exploring the area, Hat falls into the volcano and breaks the seal to the demon world. There, King Aleph rules as a kind and just king, keeping the demon world in order. His brother-in-law, Guaru the Ziark, has plans to seize the throne. When Hat enters the demon world, Guaru and King Aleph are in a struggle for power. Guaru gets the upper hand, banishing King Aleph and breaking up the continent that holds the demon world into seven separate islands. Returning to a previous tangent, Guwaru the Ziark bears a strong resemblance to Mamu, the bad guy from Doki Doki Panic. It's as if Sega was taunting Nintendo with what they could get away with. Or maybe it's all just a crazy coincidence. Not long after entering the demon world and meeting Guwaru, Hat discovers a statue which possesses the spirit of the hero of legend. Hat is told that he is a direct descendant of Magical Hat and that he shall now realize his destiny as the second incarnation of the hero to stop Guaru, reunify the continent, and restore King Aleph to the throne. Thus, Hat becomes transformed into the new Magical Hat and the adventure begins. The turban that Hat wears contains powerful magic that the wearer can control. Using the magical powers of this turban, he can defeat Guaru and complete his quest. However, if Guaru gets a hold of the turban, all hope is lost. Hat teams up with the good guys, Hotoken and the old man Tao, who are the son and brother of King Aleph, respectively. 
Kyle serves as the narrator for the series while aiding Hat on his adventure. The old man's home, which is shaped like a hat as well, serves as a base of operations and is featured in nearly every episode. Hotoken is such a coward, he'd rather just stay home. Part of his character development is learning to overcome his fears so that one day he can ascend the throne of the demon world, while also struggling to earn his father's approval. Along the way, they meet Spin, a free-spirited girl, some would say selfish. She carries a big bazooka and has pink hair. Rounding out the team is Robogu, a robot which resembles an egg and can transform into different things, like a helicopter or submarine, as well as a gorilla-style mecha that often gets Hat and his friends out of a jam. On the bad guy's side, the aforementioned Guaru the Zearch leads a group of demons who now rule over the demon world and wish to return back to Earth. His right-hand man is Dogu, a strange being with a face like an iguana and weird two-dimensional noodle arms. Guaru's son, Kowaru the Zearch, is also by his side. He's a fox, which probably means he looks more like his mother than his father. He is also cousins with Hotoken and the nephew of King Aleph. Kowaru is in love with Spin and would do anything for her. He also hates vegetables, especially green peppers. In every episode, Dogu and Kowaru try to come up with a new scheme to get Hat's turban and turn it over to Guaru. Things never work out as planned. Guaru also has an army of robots he has built to do the fighting for him. Most episodes involve Hat tangling with these creations, sea golems and giant crabs being just two of many. Then there are the denizens of the demon world. As the series continues, many more strange characters interact with Hat, Spin, and Kowaru, sometimes offering assistance, but usually making even more trouble. While the series does present itself in a serious manner, with a young boy standing up to an evil force in order to save the world, a story that never gets old. At its core, Magical Hat is not a drama, but a comedy. The animation style is bright, cute, and never threatening. The bad guy's plans always fail in hilarious fashion. The fourth wall is broken on occasion. Yoji Katakura even appears in one episode. There are also jokes and references to Japanese pop culture thrown into nearly every episode. More than that, everyone in the series is somehow related to someone else. The good guys and bad guys are having nothing more than the usual family infighting that everyone goes through. Father and son, brother to brother, in-laws. It's relatable because many of the punchlines are things you'd expect dysfunctional family members to say to each other. There are a lot of battles and excitement, but there's never a thought that Hat might actually lose. Considering that Hat is only 10 years old, the zany stories start to make sense, because if all of this were actually real, there's no way a young child could ever succeed. Contrast this with Zillion and Borgman, where the action was intense, the characters were older, the plot was serious, and the humor came only so often. Also, unlike Borgman and Zillion, Sega product placement was scarce. There were only a few instances where Hat played video games, but none of it resembled something created by Sega. There was one episode where Robogu transforms into a ship that looks like Opa Opa from Fantasy Zone. And later, the team meets aliens that resemble the Motavians in Fantasy Star, but that's about it. All 33 episodes have something interesting in them. Every character gets at least one episode where they are the focus of attention. Some of the best scenes are when Hat dresses up like a princess to keep the real princess from getting kidnapped, Guaru watching TV in nearly every episode, the time Hat visited a haunted house and a weird vegetable monster threw him around like a baseball, or something. Kawaru learns to be a ramen master. The bad guys do a manzai routine. Spin sings the theme song to the show. And of course, there is the more serious part of the show where the good guys gain ground and reassemble the continent, which was Hat's quest all along, reaching its conclusion on July 6th, 1990. I won't spoil the ending, but I will end the anime side of the story with this. The animators managed to sneak in one frame where Spin is in a state of full undress in episode 28, around the eight minute mark. Just one frame. Fuji TV never received any complaints about this, but did receive three letters of support. Oh, I
と狂気のあのファンタジーゾーンおばあがついにファミコンになったおばあLet's try to trace it as best as possible and follow along if you can. It all begins with a game called Kakefukun's Jump Heaven Speed Heck, only not heck, the other word. Released for the family computer in July 1988 by Vic Tokai, Jump Heaven is the origin point for a long string of games, all essentially the same, but with each further iteration slightly altered to the point where the final link in the chain hardly resembles the first. Jump Heaven is based on the fictional exploits of a Japanese child actor, Kenji Sagara, known on camera as Kakefu kun, named after a member of the Hanshin Tigers baseball team, who young Kakefu strongly resembled. The game is notoriously difficult, but rather fun, having to manage the game's stages with crazy jumps and slippy controls, while moving forward towards the goal, throwing projectiles or stomping on enemies along the way. What made Jump Heaven such a unique and interesting game is the way that forward momentum increases the player's speed and affects jumping as well. There are also flagpole like sticks that bend like a pole vault. The game is best played running at full speed without stopping to think about what to do next. Vic Tokai brought the game to the US where it was reworked into Kid Cool for the NES in March 1990. Cool being spelled with a K. The game was the same, save for Kid Cool, with a K, not wearing a striped baseball uniform. Thanks to an unusual working relationship between Vic Tokai and Sega, Kakefu kun, aka Kid Cool, became Psycho Fox for the Sega Master System, released outside of Japan around the same time as Kid Cool. Unlike the NES game, Psycho Fox is a slightly different game. The running and jumping physics are the same, though just slightly tightened. The stages are redesigned totally from scratch. In addition to the standard projectile, the Psycho Fox can also punch. Another change replaces the spinning wheel bonus game in Kid Cool with an Amidakuji bonus game, where the player chooses a random pathway that may have a prize on the other side waiting for you. The game is commonly seen in Japan, and even though Psycho Fox was not sold in Japan, the game is filled with Japanese folklore and imagery. Despite creating the basis of the game, Vic Tokai is credited nowhere. Neither company owned a stake in each other, but shared resources, personnel, and distributors, which eventually led to Vic Tokai developing games for Sega directly rather than licensing them as a third party. After Psycho Fox, Sega and Vic Tokai took this concept and applied it to Magical Hat. Releasing the game for the Mega Drive on December 15, 1990, nearly six months after the series ended. Now three degrees removed from Kakefu kun, the game only has a faint resemblance to its original source, but has become a polished, refined, and enjoyable game. Hat must reach the goal in each stage by running, jumping, punching, and sometimes swimming his way there. In many ways, things feel inspired by Alex Kidd. Each stage map is huge and requires heavy exploration in all four directions, with all stages completely different from Psycho Fox. Hat can gain speed by continuously moving forward, leading to longer jumps. He can also flutter in the air to add more distance. Hat needs to keep in motion as many platforms will fall underneath him immediately. There are question mark blocks that bounce Hat around like he's on a trampoline. The game follows the themes of the series very closely. Much like the anime, Guwaru has taken control of the demon world, separating the continent into seven pieces, threatening to conquer the human world above. Many major characters from the series are present in the game. Tao and Hotoken appear in dialogue scenes, as well as the item selection screen, explaining what each one does. Robogu accompanies Hat on his quest, being used as the in game projectile. Hat gets taunted by Kawaru and Dogu before each boss battle. Statues that look like Moai heads found on Easter Island contain items. 
Among these are capsules that allow Robogu to transform into two different machines that were seen often in the anime series. There are also colored balls which grant different abilities, like a protective shield or clearing all enemies on screen. Sometimes you'll find potions that give Hat higher jumps or stronger attacks. Other statues contain coins, which are used as credits in the bonus game that appears between stages. The Amida Kuji bonus game from Psycho Fox returns, as well as the tried and true bonus chance style slot machine, something also featured in the series. Also worth mentioning is that in each of the boss stages, a special item must be found in one of the statues, or else you can't move on to the next island. Each of the seven islands have a different theme, Jungle Island, Sand Island, and so on. These correspond to the seven separated areas in the anime. The graphics are colorful, bright, and cheery, with just enough texture to the backgrounds where needed. The art style follows strong, sharp outlines, complemented by only a few colors. That choice makes everything on screen pop and clearly stand out. Hat is animated with about a dozen different frames of animation, certainly more than other games of the time. He makes several different facial expressions depending on his movements that add more life to the character. As for the soundtrack, some, though not all, of the music from the series is included, with a great renditioning of the opening tema to start the game. The rest of the soundtrack works well, complementing the bright graphics and tense on-screen action. With the design choices made, Magical Hat has aged better than most 16-bit games and looks pretty good on a modern TV. Alongside the Mega Drive game, Sega released a series of Magical Hat action figures, as well as other small items such as stickers, magnets, notebooks, plates, and toy masks. A CD soundtrack of music from the series was released as well. The disc is quite rare these days, with copies starting around 20,000 yen, or about 160 US dollars. As well, Sega released a coin-operated mechanical game based on the eye catch used in each episode. The game kind of works like a slot machine, where if you can line up certain character combinations on the dial, you win large payouts of tokens. As Sega rolled into 1991, the company was preparing for a change of direction, but Sega's ventures into other media were far from over. The conclusion of the Magical Hat anime series and release of the video game wasn't the end of the road for all parties involved. Sega took what already worked well with Magical Hat and transformed it into yet another game, exporting the fifth version of Kakefukun's game to the Western world as Decap Attack in 1991. Gameplay-wise, Magical Hat and Decap Attack are similar, but enough changes were made to keep everyone from saying the two games are exactly the same. The slot machine game has been removed and a life meter was added, now allowing the player up to three hits for each life. The bright and colorful world of Magical Hat has been transformed into a scary, albeit comical, Halloween-type game. The soundtrack is all new and one of the best on the Genesis. The star of Decap Attack is Chuck D. Head, who, much like Hat, must stop the ruler of the underworld, Max D. Cap, from coming above ground to conquer the surface. Chuck has some help in the game from Igor and Frank N. Stein, who replaced Tao and Hotokin. Don't forget, Frank N. Stein is the doctor, as if you're not aware. Decap Attack became one of the best-selling Genesis and Mega Drive games and has been included in several compilations over the last 20 years. The game was also popular enough to receive its own comic series, which appeared in the UK publication Sonic the Comic from 1993 to 1998. Psycho Fox was also given another life, with the game being changed once more for a special release in Brazil and Portugal in 1995. The game stars the eponymous Sapo Jule, a frog with stinky feet. He was first created as an action figure a few years prior by Tectoy, who also had the exclusive rights to distribute the Sega Master System in Brazil. Sapo Jule was also featured in remakes of Kung Fu Kid and Astro Warrior. With this game, there are a grand total of six variations of the original formula created for Kakefukun in 1988. 
Fuji Media Group began to publish its own video games, first under the Pony Canyon label and later as FCI. The releases had very little to do with any existing Fuji property in most cases. The most popular titles were based on the Dungeons & Dragons series of table role-playing games and World Championship Wrestling, both of which were imported into Japan with great success, thanks to FCI. Studio Piero is still in business today, and since 1990 has produced some of the most well-known anime programs around, including, but not limited to, Yu Yu Hakusho, Bleach, and Naruto. TV adaptations of video games have also been animated by Piero, such as Power Stone and Blue Dragon. Yoji Katakura, who is credited with the design of Magical Hat, also authored and illustrated a series of manga books that were produced alongside the anime series and afterwards. Sega had no involvement with this version of Magical Hat, and as such, features a different set of adventures. The series came to an end in 1997, when Katakura passed away. The finale of the Magical Hat manga series was left unfinished. With three media mixes in four years, Sega decided to pump the brakes for a while, waiting several years before returning to the format. Sega would find breakthrough success with Sonic the Hedgehog not long after the conclusion of Magical Hat. While the three series done in conjunction with Sega were entertaining, they were also very expensive. The returns may have been profitable, but the entire venture involved a massive upfront investment of time and money, with Sonic taking Sega to a 60% market share in the US and 20% in Japan. There was little need to expand elsewhere, when what was already working worked very well. The next Sega Media Mix would arrive in 1994 with Magic Knight Ray Earth. The 4-5 to five year gap allowed for a game experience that was a massive improvement over the 8 and 16-bit days. Magic Knight Ray Earth for the Sega Saturn offered not only a much larger in-game world with better graphics, but also full animation and voice acting from the series, something that was impossible before. In 1996, Sega tried its hand with a live-action series, Changelion. Like other media mixes, a line of action figures would follow, as well as one video game, this time on the Sega Pico, the computer that thinks it's a toy. From there, Sega was involved in even more collaborations that resulted in a video game with some other media production accompanying it, right up to the present day. For Sega, it's always been about the complete experience, providing the customer with the world they have created and the story that can be told. Magical Hat being just one example of many where a company that is thought of as just making video games can be so much more. Kakefu-kun, aka Kid Cole. K-k-k-k-k. Ah, it's too many Ks. I need some Kaluha.